little bit more on working out what you should be giving and what they're doing. So just thinking of a standard person, maybe a little bit more fit than many of us, but the standard male under the age of 50 is 60% water. We are one big bag of water moving around. Of that water, about 18% is extracellular and the rest is intracellular. And about 5% of your body weight is plasma volume. So those are the general compartments that we have to think about when we're giving fluids as treatment. A fundamental principle in all this is the principle of isoosmolality. And what that says is that all compartments of the body have essentially identical osmolalities, which is around 280 to 290 milliosmoles of water, uh, per kilogram of water. This occurs despite the fact that the composition of all compartments is actually very different. And it occurs because the capillary endothelium and almost all cell membranes are freely permeable to water. So water can just move anywhere back and forth through our bodies. The primary determinant of that distribution of fluid, water, between compartments is the number of actively osmotic particles. And this is discrete particles in the solution independent of their valence. Oh, come yes. Hmm? They weren't on? Yes. Hmm? I need to go back? Yes. Mm -hmm. Will you close? Hmm? Ah, I didn't realize that. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. <laughs> so. Okay. Still not right there. Okay. Um, I'm not sure which one it is. I can't tell because she's the way she's numbered them. Eleven. All right, well, let me just go back a little bit. So this was the slide I was starting with. It was surprising for the lack of reaction. So, um, so looking at the typical body, so 60% of the total weight is water. As I said, we're one big bag of water. Of that, about 18% is extracellular, and about 5% is uh, plasma water. And I said there was this uh, principle of isoosmolality. I'll just repeat it because of the distraction here. So all major fluid compartments of the body have essentially the same osmolalities, around 290 milliosmoles. And this occurs despite differences in composition. And it occurs because the cap capillary endothelium and almost all cell, cell membranes are freely permeable to water. So I said the primary factor determining that distribution is the... Uh, uh, a fluid is the number of osmotically active particles in each region. And this is discrete particles, independence of their valence. All right, we'll move on now. So these two terms, osmolality and osmolarity. So osmolality is the number of osmoles per weight. Osmolarity is the number of osmoles per volume. Now the preferred term is actually the osmolality because that's the pure physics term. <clears throat> the reason for that is volumes, especially in a gas, can change. The gas can get compressed. But a mass is a fixed unit in physics, and so it's not alterable. The problem is it's not easy to get the mass. To do that, you have to have the, the volume in some container, then you have to subtract the weight of the container. Versus volume, you just have to look at the height. So generally, we're going to describe this as osmolarity, although it's not the precise term, it's close enough. So there's three general compartments, as I showed you. There's the plasma, 
interstitial space and the intracellular, and together the plasma and interstitial are the extracellular space, making up about 35% of the total, and the intracellular 65%. And this just shows the distribution of osmoles in the different compartments. So in the serum and interstitial space, sodium and chloride make up the bulk of the particles with a small number of other particles in the solution. However, in the cell, which remember is double the volume of the extracellular environment, potassium is the major positive player. Chloride plays a small role, about 10 millimoles, milliosmoles, and phosphate and proteins play, uh, make up the major part of the negatives. So we spend all our time actually looking at plasma, which is pretty close to the interstitial, not quite, but pretty close, but it's actually very different than the intracellular environment, which has twice as, many, twice as much volume as the extracellular. And that's where all the action is. That's where all the metabolism and all the things are occurring, and we never even look at that part of the system because we can't. Now, osmolarity determines the amount of water in the body. So as I said, in the extracellular space, it's mainly sodium and chloride. In the intracellular, the positives are, are potassium, magnesium, and, and negative is phosphorus and proteins. <clears throat> the key point that I learned early on in my career, and I think is the number one message I want to get across today, is we don't expand volume with water. We expand it with a salt solution because those osmoles hang on to the water. And that's how we determine water balance. So when you're saying somebody is fluid positive, what you are really saying is they're in positive sodium balance. So sodium, the elements of sodium, potassium, and chloride, a key point is they can't be metabolized. So the only way you get them in your body, you take them in or you put them out, but they can't be broken down. So those particles that are there are essential for hanging on into the water, and that's how they evolve through nature. As I said, in the extracellular environment, sodium is the major player, potassium on the intracellular side, but that potassium is in a similar range to the sodium. So just thinking about the sodium pretty well tells you the whole balance. Now, an important point is the charges of all positives have to equal all negatives, so therefore the sodium must be balanced by a negative charge. So just by knowing sodium, you know there has to be a negative that match it, otherwise you would explode. So that's why sodium is a very good guide to what's happening. And through evolution, that's the major way our bodies have worked out hanging uh, onto volume. Thus, regulating sodium essentially regulates our body osmolalities. And that's why I'm emphasizing this point that fluid balance is really about sodium balance. Now, maintenance fluids. So I think it's really important to separate maintenance fluids from resuscitation. They're two different things. It's like having a checking account and a savings account. You don't want to mix them up. If you start using your savings account for your daily expenses, you're going to be in big trouble down the line. So checking is keeping up with your daily needs. So what are the needs? Well, the first is water. We, we are water-based solutions. That's whenever you hear about people looking for life on another planet, you're looking for water because our chemistry is all water-based. You lose about 0.4 liters per day in insensible losses, and your urine output is 60 to 70 mils per hour, which means another 1.4, 1.6 liters per day. So you need roughly two liters. Now that'll change if you were walking here in the desert in 56 degree weather, which I got to experience a number of years ago. That water loss is rapid and big, but standard in the air conditioning buildings in this country, you're losing less than two liters a day. <laughs> Um, and this number is 60 to 70, you could get away with less, you'd be okay, but in an intensive care unit, if the urine, urine output is getting down to 20 cc's an hour, the nurse is calling you every 10 minutes. So you can't run it that low, it's just too tight. You'd probably be okay, the patient could be okay, but the nurses will never let you do it. Now, the Canadian and American food guides are basically the same, and looking this up pretty well throughout Western Europe, and uh, even I actually looked them up for the Middle East, and still the same, depending upon the temperatures or where you're working, you need about 2.3 grams per day, which is about, actually it's a little higher than that, about 130 milliequivalents of sodium. So 100 to 130, 100 to 130 milliequivalents. What's two grams of uh, sodium? Not sodium chloride, sodium. It's about a teaspoon of salt. 
That's all you're supposed to have. And I saw actually a big publicity campaign on the internet trying to get people to reduce their salt intake in this country as well as others. So let's take an example. So let's say you're giving your patient, post-op patient, and you have, quote, maintenance fluids, and you're giving 100 mLs per hour of 0.9% saline. How much sodium is that person getting? Well, each liter has 154 millimoles of sodium. Uh, at 0.1 liter an hour, that's 2.4 liters a day. Multiply that by the uh, uh, amount of sodium, that's 370 moles. You need the molecular weight of sodium, which is 23. Multiply that, and you end up with 8.5 grams. Remember, 2.3 is what's recommended. What does that mean? Well, a kosher dill pickle is about a gram. So if you're giving uh, 100 mLs per hour, that is like a bottle of dill pickles with the juice. That's what you're doing. Okay, so let's switch to sugar. So your brain needs about 100 grams of glucose a day. Uh, a liter of dextrose, D5W, has 50 grams per liter. So two liters gives you 100 grams. And with that 100 grams, you can reduce protein breakdown by about 60%, 60 65%. Still leaves 35 that you got to make sure you put in an, uh, other types of feeding and protein to maintain those sources. But that's a pretty big reduction if you can give it to your patient. So two liters of normal saline is going to, uh, and sorry, two liters of D5W is going to give you your daily requirement of sugar to keep the brain happy. So the general principles of maintenance fluids for a 70 kilogram man, you need about two to three milliequivalents of sodium. That's about 154. It's a little generous. You actually need a little less, but that's a liter of saline. You need about 30 mLs per kilogram of water. As I said, two liters. You need sodium, the uh, potassium. Now the potassium is actually the requirement. This is a bit off. You need about 160 milliequivalents a day, but don't do that in your IV. Don't do that. You'll kill people. So you have to aim lower and then catch up, especially if the kidneys aren't working. And you need about 100 grams of glucose. So if you give somebody about 80 cc's an hour, two liters a day, of half normal saline and D5W, you actually basically give their main requirements. And you can scale this up and down depending upon the person's size and other conditions going on. The crucial point is thinking about the total amount of sodium you're giving, because that's what's deciding the fluids in the body. You can make adjustments, as I said, for oliguria, for thyroidematis. Critically ill patients usually have excess ADH, so the sodium tends to run a little bit lower, but it usually levels off at the 132, 134 range, which I think is still acceptable, although some people get very nervous at those lower sodiums. Um, okay, so a person is five liters positive balance. That means that person, I like it in pounds, it's more dramatic than, um, than um, uh, kilograms. That means they're 11 pounds heavier. That's a lot of extra weight. For my body size, that's gonna be, um, it's gonna be, uh, it was about seven, eight percent increase in my weight. Okay, let's go back to the general schema. So we had the extracellular and the intracellular space. So when I think about resuscitation, which I'm going to switch to now, um, I think about hydration, I think about the extracellular volume, and I think about the intracellular volume. Now, let me start off with a clinical case. The patient had a gastric bypass, suffered sepsis from an asthmatic leak, gross edema, 25 liters positive. You know, you're checking the pitting edema and your hand sinks up to the wrist. It's really a demitous person. The serum sodium is 154. Is this person dehydrated? And it comes down to what is the definition of dehydrated? And this term is really frequently misused. So what is dehydration? So have you already thought about it? Were they de dehydrated or not? Think. Okay. If you've thought about it, let's go through it. Hydration, the state of hydration refers to the amount of water relative to solute particles. So dehydration simply means not enough water for the solute an osmolality that's above normal. So that person who had a sodium of 154 but was massively uh, edematous is dehydrated. That person has a lot of water but has even more sodium per amount of water. But you could also be dehydrated by walking through the desert and losing an excess of water and having a normal sodium and you would also be dehydrated. It has nothing to do with the overall volume status. It simply is related of the water relative to sodium. 
So the very first thing I do when I'm planning my fluids at the bedside, I look at the serum sodium. And that's how I decide whether they're hydrated or not, and I decide how much room I have with free water relative to sodium. Okay. Now, the second thing I think of is the extracellular volume. So is there an excess volume? So what I always like to say to my residents, a diagnostic test is performed. The patient is touched. What a strange phenomenon. But this is how you decide this. If they're edematous, they have excess total body sodium. If they have pleural fusions on an x-ray, if they have ascites on an exam, uh, any extra fluids that shouldn't be there, they have increased total body sodium. So ascites, pulmonary edema, pleural effusions. Decreased volume in the extracellular space, that's tough, actually. We do not really have good uh, techniques. I actually use skin turgor, although it's heavily criticized in the literature. But if you follow this regularly, especially if you're doing renal replacement therapy continuously, you can feel the change in the turgor in the arm. So just squeezing the arm and just feeling does the does it skin sort of hang up there or is it nice and pliable? So you can actually feel the changes in your patient as you're doing that. A loss of sweat in the armpit, but that's late and not easy. We, we don't have good uh, techniques. You really have to think about the volume status of your patient on the low side. Now, the thing that we care the most about is intravolume, intravascular volume. So you know, if, I haven't even got there yet. I spent my time on the other two, but this is the one that clinically we worry about. And in fact, once again, we really do not have good tools for this. So excess volume, elevated jugular veins, third heart sound, pulmonary venous congestion on an x-ray, but that's about it. That's about it. Decreased volume, well, the best test is postural hypotension. Uh, the neck vein should be flat to be consistent. Tachycardia is a lousy sign. And we really do not have great signs for whether you're over or under in your intravascular volume. And basically, you have to usually empirically test this by doing something and see whether it changes. Yes, there's the dynamic techniques, but they, don't, they tell you the patient will respond. They don't tell you what the volume is. Now, what happens when you give normal saline? So when you're giving normal saline, it's supposed to distribute primarily in the plasma space and interstitial space, and it shouldn't go into the intracellular space because it's isoosmolar with that region if you have a normal osmolality. If you don't, it will change the concentrations. And then if you have a lower uh, osmolality in the extracellular space, then some of that will move into the intracellular space. Another important point is we use that rule of one-third, two-thirds. And that's because it distributes between the plasma and the interstitial space. But if you have a very expanded interstitial space, you're massively edematous, you're no longer getting one-third, two-thirds. So that woman with 25 liters of edema, when you gave her more saline, you're giving about 100, 150 in the plasma space per liter, and the rest is all going into the interstitial space because it distributes between the two. So you have to remember that if your patient is very edematous, the effect of saline is much less than when they aren't. And so the more you give and the more edematous you make the person, the less effective that saline becomes. I will skip this for the sake of time. Now, colloid osmotic pressure, so that's the pr pressure created by proteins. <clears throat> and proteins create an effect because the walls are impermeable to, permeable to plasma proteins, so they hang on to fluid in one compartment. Um, only about 0.5% of total osmotic pressure is produced by this, and there's some other effects, which for the sake of time I won't go into. But to emphasize that the major factor in this is albumin. So about 85% of that osmotic, of oncotic effect in blood is from albumin. And if you're looking at, for example, cardiac surgery patients, almost all these patients come back with an albumin that's uh, down in the uh, 20 or so um, 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 uh, millimoles per liter, or per two per 100 mLs, which means it's about half normal, very frequent. So they all have low osmolalities. So what happens when you give something that's iso-oncotic and iso-osmolar? It's supposed to distribute just in the plasma space and not affect the interstitial space or the intracellular space. However, if it actually, uh, however, if you're leaky, it can leak into the interstitial space, and a lot of that is lost, as nicely shown by the group in Vancouver in 1999. 
And when it does that, it expands the interstitial space and it may actually pull some fluid out of the intracellular space. The reason why that's important, cells don't like to change their volume. They like to remain constant because they've got those fancy proteins in the walls. So when you change their volume, you stretch those structures and start triggering intracellular events. Now when you give a hyper-oncotic solution, like 25% albumin, now what you're doing, you're making the plasma more on, have a higher oncotic pressure. It's going to suck fluid out of the interstitial space, and that will then suck some more fluid out of the intracellular space. So you do have an effect on that intracellular space. So giving 25% albumin likely is much more than volume. You probably are producing intracellular signaling and producing some other processes. What about the oncotic value of red blood cells? None. Red blood cells are in suspension in the solution, so they do not produce any change in, change in oncotic pressure. What they do do is take up space. And if that weren't true, every time you gave blood, the hemoglobin wouldn't change if it sucked in water, but it doesn't. Just going to finish off with this one last example here. So this is a patient that I happened to come across um, and doing rounds, and we got called because this patient was deteriorating. You can see this blood pressure had been falling for a long time, but nobody seemed to notice. And so just looking at this expanded, uh, what first we noticed was the hemoglobin had dropped from 124 to 68. So we get the bedside, and there's this low pressure, low CVP. We're waiting for blood because nothing is there. And so we give a bolus of fluid, about 250 mLs. You can see the CVP went up on the bottom, but at the same time, nothing happens to the blood pressure. So if you've got volume, nothing happens. Some norepinephrine is started while waiting for the blood. I didn't want to pour in a lot of saline because she lost blood. She didn't lose saline. So I didn't want to pour in and dilute her more. So with norepinephrine, her blood pressure begins to rise. Blood comes. We can turn off the norepinephrine, and she does better. The point I'm making here is that volume alone in this person who was now cycling down and did not have her proper hemoglobin was not really helping her. You actually had to have a transient help while waiting for the blood, which is the real solution. So in summary, uh, treat maintenance and resuscitation separately. Fluid balance is really about sodium balance. That's my primary message. When resuscitating patients, consider which compartment is actually being resuscitated. What are you trying to fix? Are the fluids the best solution? Consider the reserves. I didn't discuss chloride at all, big subject, but the reason why I didn't, the answer isn't in yet, so I thought I'll just stay off it for now. We could spend the whole lecture just on that. And I think the crucial thing is avoid overloading the patient and creating what I call the Michelin Man syndrome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we, for discussion? discussion? Huh? Have you Any questions? Questions? Couple of questions? Thank you both, uh, Dr. Magda and Dr. Pinsky, for this um, outstanding brainstorming and uh, uh, lectures. You really, uh, I, I think I've been looking for of my older resident in the room uh, listening to this because we always face it uh, as clinician when they call us in the middle of the night how, how far we should go with our vasopressor. So uh, from a clinical point of view, uh, I want your opinion. Uh, in, in a normal tensive patient and in a hypertensive patient, how far we should push the pressors? What's the first how, far, how high should we push the in the hypotensive? When, well, when uh, personally, I shocked. struggle with that. I, I actually... As you might have guessed, because I always seem to be a little different. I actually don't use the mean in most patients. I actually like the systolic. I find one of the problems with the mean is that if you have somebody who has a low diastolic pressure, then the mean is low, and I'm not sure what that means. 
Now, I don't know if I'm right. Uh, I always make sure that it's a real systolic. I make sure that the tracing isn't blunted, and I would usually get a cuff pressure, and that's my gold standard. But that having been said, my targets, I mean, I basically I would agree with being 90 systolic or around 65, but you can't in some patients, was your question. You get that call, and the, and the pressure is like 85 systolic, and the mean is 55, and you can't. I don't know what the answer is. In that article I wrote, I, my first paragraph, I said, I'm not going to tell you the answer. This is how I would do the study, and I think we have to do the studies. Now, I was impressed, Michael, that you showed a bunch of those saying 50 for a lot of organs was okay. So it sort of supports that argument. I'll just make one quick point. I think, as you nicely showed, the kidney is going to take a hit. So the question, how important is it to try to save the kidney, and are we damaging the rest of the body, and we, or should we just give up on it? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think we need studies to answer that. Well, um, in the hypotensive patient, the, um, actually I disagree with Shelley. If I want to know if the patient's lost vasomotor tone, the best way to assess that is the diastolic arterial pressure. Because if I have a decrease in arterial tone, the diastolic pressure can get very low. <coughs> and I can have an adequate cardiac output, so my pulse pressure will be very high. My mean arterial pressure will be low a bit, but the diastolic will be low. If I have a low cardiac output as the cause, as in severe heart failure, I'll have a low pulse pressure, but the diastolic pressure is actually quite high. And you see the pressure going like this and then going straight for a while. And so the diastolic fall off is a measure of the baseline tone, and is the one thing I expect to see change if the norepinephrine is working. The other way to look at it is why are you giving norepinephrine in the first place? What is the pathophysiology that's causing the loss of vasomotor tone? And to a large extent, uh, it has to do with mediators and the hyporesponsiveness of the vascular endothelium to its normal adrenergic response. In a septic shock patient, they have increased catecholamines in the blood, not decreased. Before you start, they've already got more than you do. If you took purified blood from them with all the toxins of their blood out, but everything else there, and infuse it in you, you would become hypertensive. Okay. So what we have is a hypo-responsiveness. And so in my management, I start with norepinephrine. I don't, the only indication for dopamine is hypotension associated with bradycardia. Okay. Uh, so for me, I give uh, norepinephrine, and if that doesn't work and I get, I'm pushing up to 20 mics per kilogram per minute, then I believe uh, Jim Russell and I start vasopressin. But I start at 0 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute and don't change it because I'm giving it as a hormone replacement to improve the adrenergic receptor. But <clears throat> the, one of the other things that uh, Larry Wood asked me many years ago when I showed our first work showing that there was a generalized vasodilation across all vascular beds and septic shock, his response to me is, then why are you worried about hypotension? Yeah, why are you worried about hypotension? If every, vas if he, if every vascular bed is dilated, just increase cardiac output, and with the hypotension, you'll have an adequate flow to the organs. Now, you'll excessively perfuse some organs, but no one will be in trouble. And the answer is you simply don't know that's true, and we do have evidence of end organ hypoperfusion. Furthermore, the kidney will always take a hit, not only because of the pressure flow relationship, but because it has two arterial circuits in series, the efferent and the afferent arterial. And when you have those in series, you're going to cause profound hypofiltration through the glomerulus, and that's going to cause renal failure. Well, you, you really hit the right question. <laughs> Uh, yes, the diastolic is down, but probably when it's down, I suspect a lot of it is that critical closing pressure, and the question is where and what. The, and the key thing is in the muscle, one of the problems in severe sepsis, I think the muscle dilates, which becomes a real problem on a number of levels. It partly contributes to the rise in output, but it's a waste of flow. Now, there's also an important difference on where alpha receptors act. So years ago, my favorite study, but it's a really complicated one, we were studying the barrel, effective bioreceptors on the distribution of, uh, on uh, uh, compensating for the drop in pressure. And one of the striking things, is not our data initially, but we showed the same thing, is when you activate the baroreceptors, you vasoconstrict your peripheral bed, presumably through sympathetic tone, more than you do your splanchnic bed, which makes a sense from an evolutionary point of view. You want to protect those vital organs. 
Well, that creates an interesting shift of fluid back to the central compartment, which actually can decrease cardiac output through complex means. But it also says to me that when we give norepinephrine, I would not expect that you're going to get an equal constriction in all departments. Now, I think at moderate doses, maybe it's more physiological, and you're still, I agree, you already have a high tone, and you're going to do it. But at higher doses, I don't know what you're doing. So some, actually, Michael and I completely agree on this one and our patterns, interestingly. So that's, I do exactly what he does. When I get to 20, I switch to, va I add vasopressin. I don't have any evidence for it. I don't think the VAST study tells us. They did actually better at the lower ones than the higher. But that's what I do because I still think it works. I really follow the lactate and I follow the cardiac output a lot. So cardiac output becomes a very important guide. So I guess that Larry Wood message got to me. I like to know that that's going in the right direction. And if the lactate's coming down, I'm happy. But I've gotten to the point where I've stopped going to the, some of those ridiculously high doses. When I get to about 50 or so of norepinephrine, I'm just not sure what it's doing. And I've started not going that high. Have I caused harm or not? I don't know. I've had some, I had one a recent heart transplant patient who I ran with a systolic pressure of around 75 to 80, systolic, for over 24 hours because I couldn't get it higher. I just gave up. And he recovered and did better. And I ran him at that level. Yeah, I'd lost his kidneys and had to dialyze him for a while. But, but he actually recovered. I just couldn't. And I thought if I went higher, I was making him worse. Just going back to the diastolic, one of my favorite experiences with our, a good friend of ours and well-known to many people, but DDA Payen, who worked with us for a few years, and he was obsessed with diastolic pressure. And when I found when I take, took over with him, I would just do uh, norepinephrine weaning rounds. I was just taking everybody off the norepinephrine. I found he was way off. I didn't find I was killing people when I took it off. So I am not convinced that you need to chase the diastolic pressure. He did the experiment for me. Well... You probably had shown that they no longer needed it. Um, when you give a patient who is hypotensive a vasopressor, you're making a philosophical statement. You are stating that you know better than the patient's body what you want to have to the vasomotor tone of the individual organs because all the organs will vasoconstrict in proportion to their adrenergic responsiveness. And... Um, uh, yes, we do. And uh, the point is, is that when you have a person who is getting better on uh, vasopressors and you wean them off, you actually see their organ perfusions increasing because they no longer needed the high level of vasopressors. So I do what uh, Shelley does as well. When I come on service, the first thing I try to do is go down on the PEEP, go down on the norepinephrine. And almost invariably on every patient I can, which doesn't mean that they were not doing the right thing before, but it means that people get afraid when they go up on these vasopressors and they think they need to hold them there. And the answer is you have no idea. If I've got you on a level of a vasopressor, the body will relate to that and it'll maintain its tone accordingly, even if it's getting healthier. And you don't know you ne don't need it until you start to take it away. So that's, but anyway... That's an interesting question. We could talk about this forever, but I saw that there's another question in the audience. I just want to go through that. I was nodding at first when you said, um, uh, I forgot exactly where you said it, but I had a different interpretation. A good example is phenylephrin. So people frequently give phenylephrin. The studies in the literature show that you almost never increase cardiac output, with a few exceptions, pregnant woman being one of them maybe, an alpha blocker, if you have a spinal shock. But what... What you do do at that first stage, when you're giving that small amount, you are hoping that the autoregulation, the brain and the heart are going to say, I'm more metabolically active, and although you've constricted, I'm going to fight that, and I will do that. And that probably will occur at moderate levels. So if you're at the 8, 12, 15 level of levofed, I think those organs can distinguish. It's as you're going up, then you're affected, begin to affect everything. Where's that break? I don't know. And maybe that's what vasopressin is doing. It's letting you come down and letting those other factors come in. There's a question from back there. There's a question back there. I'm sorry, she raised her hand and she took it down. I guess not. Sorry. If you notice, I guess the big answer to your question, you notice what I put first was antibiotics, get things going, source control. Without that, uh, it's Thank tough. You.
if you don't treat sepsis, the source of sepsis, I don't care what you give in terms of the volume, it won't matter. Uh, you have to give antibiotics and source control, period. And if you don't do that, they're dead. Now, we never talked about the concept of whether you should be giving sodium chloride or a balanced salt solution. 